Okay, so um, before we look at the frets, let's get the truss rod cover out of here so that we can um, adjust that if need be. <laughs> so this is an ebony truss rod cover, a little frisky, sort of looks like a high heel shoe, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, there's that, and um, uh, Gibson patented this truss rod design in 1922. And nobody else could use it, of course, for quite some time. I think it was 17 years. And then um, uh, D'Angelico started using it while well, everybody started using it because it's a really good, simple design. Uh, it's the simplest kind of truss rod where it's just a basically a threaded rod or carriage bolt or... Um, little stick of metal it's, that's um, 3 16 of an inch, so that's, I guess, between uh, 4 and 5 millimeters in diameter um, with a fine thread on it to make adjustment easy. And um, it, the way it works is it's positioned low in the neck so that it balances the forces of the strings. Um, just by being on the other side of the of the neck, uh, we'll have a we'll have a deeper talk about truss rods someday. But for now, let's just have a look and see if we need to adjust the truss rod. So what I'm seeing is that. High fret up here, what is it? 20 is quite high. Um, but the rest of the neck looks pretty good. Twenty is not so high in the middle. Gosh, this looks pretty pretty great, really. Um, and on the treble side, well, okay, so from my point of view, the, the frets in this area are a little bit higher than they need to be, particularly the 20th fret over here. And we're going to have to take some frets, some material off the frets here. Also, we're going to have to take some material off these dented frets down at the low end of the neck. Um, and, and so I'm gonna just make a educated guess. With the strings off, I'm gonna take that material off and, um, and, we'll have, and then we'll put the strings back on and, and see what we have to do next. When I take the tension off the strings like this, I like to uh, count turns. It makes it a little bit easier when I string it back up. Mm 
Okay. So, okay, we can see the string grooves continue really only up to about fret eight or nine at the most. And then these frets have hardly been worn. And then, as I said, these frets at the end, particularly this one on the base side, uh, present as high, um, so according to our straight edge. And I'm going to use my uh, trusty file in a wooden block. We'll do a riff on how you make one of these. Um, and I'm going to cut in what I think of as a double diagonal pattern. So we're cutting plus and minus this little angle. That's going to help us maintain the shape of the frets, of the curve of the frets. Um, something that would be harder to accomplish if you cut just in a singular longitudinal direction like that. And this, is, this file is sharp. It's a single cut file. It leaves a nice surface and cuts efficiently. So, still have a little nick over here. We're going to keep filing. down to this guy's favorite notes. <laughs> Still a little filing to do. Tiny grooves down here. So now we should probably have a look at the fret height and see what we've got. So here's a little um, piece of plastic I machined to hold this dial indicator. And I have this set um, so that when it sits flat, it reads zero. <laughs> and then as it reads the fret height, it's going to go backwards, unfortunately, because it was designed to read in this direction. But because we're starting out at, what is this, about 100, we're going to read the dial backwards. So when, when we put it over here, we're going to see that our fret height is about 30 thousandths. Okay, so from 0, 10, 20, 30 thousandths. And here. Yeah, just about the same. 
a little over 30. Again, about the same. Thirty-five-ish. Well, and this is thirty-eight, I guess. So um, now these frets are going to come down anyway. So we have a condition now where the when the frets are done, they're going to be about thirty thousandths high off the fingerboard, and that's getting towards the low end of um, of what we like to have for fret height. Frets typically start out between, well, the fretless wonder frets, which some of you might know about, start off at 27 thousandths, but very few people f f favor those. So a 27 thousandth fret by the time it's dressed, of course, is less um, than that. Um, and I think 30 is kind of universally perceived as being sort of the lowest a fret can be and still be uh, feel serviceable to the player. Um, higher frets are desired by people that do a lot of string bending. Um, we're going to suggest that uh, players of a guitar like that, this guitar, um, uh, are not going to be playing light strings and bending them a lot, although I think 30 thousandths is enough to get underneath the strings. So that's uh, 0.75 millimeters, by the way. Um, anyhow, we're going to go ahead and take off some material up here, and, and, and then we'll string it back up and see what further corrections we'll need to do. So I'm trying to take off this fret 20 here and then just try and lower this whole area, last four or five frets. to see where this bridge is supposed to go. Okay, so we're back in tune, and uh, we'll have a quick look at the action with this, um, except no sub substitutes, Stuart McDonald's string action gauge. 
and it's looking like 60 thousandths. And 50, so it's a little bit lower on the top end. So this is pretty much what what you would want for this guitar. Maybe a little higher, um, probably not very much lower. And uh, so 60 thousandths is uh, 1.5 millimeters. Um, all right, so now we'll have a look with our straight edge. And we still have some high, these last four or five frets are a little bit high. Um, and these in the middle, there's a little bump right here. And the top end is a little bit high also, but less so. So I'm going to um, pick out the frets that are an issue with Magic Marker. So, that's what we're going to go after. Now, <clears throat> here's a technique that I've been using for decades that I just love so much, which is to use um, a piece of um, eighth-inch material. These are aluminum, but you could make them really out of uh, eighth-inch plywood or plastic, I think some plastic, here's a plastic one made out of uh, just acrylic, the uh, acrylic sheet you get at the hardware store. And on it is um, some auto body style uh, 320 paper. And, and the, the technique is to get underneath these strings with this thing, with the strings at tension, and then We can take off the material we need and leave a nice finish without damaging anything. Now the frets are pretty hard to cut and um, this kind of sandpaper, well no sandpaper will hold up to it for very long. So. That's why I changed that, changed the sandpaper end for end. Let's see how that works. Let's see what we did. Okay, we're getting there. Still have um, some frets that are a tiny bit higher than we would like at the end. And again, we have a, a little bit of bump here. Not, not a problem anymore at the very end, but up here in the teens. And the top end is similar to the base side, but a little less so. So basically, we didn't take enough off, and we're going to go back in and do the same thing. Now, one other thing you can do to make this go a little bit easier, some people will like, like this method, is that you take a Sharpie, and you pick up the strings with it, at an angle like this, and then the Sharpie just rides on the tops of the frets and holds the frets up in the air, I mean the strings up in the air. 
so that you can get in there and sand a little more aggressively without the strings pressing down on the back of this plate. I will have to say there is an elephant in the room right here. And I know uh, some of you can see in this nice close up that the spacing of the frets in this um, uh, is obviously a problem. Um, we can see that the distance between this fret and this fret is certainly longer than the distance from here to here. And there's other problems in here too. Not quite as bad, but this fret is pretty badly misplaced. Anyhow, I'm going to address this separately and show you uh, some things about that. <laughs> but we'll first of all, we'll get a, we'll get this thing to play as well as it can. All right, so here's the fret. Here's the um, the wear on the sandpaper is completely blown away. Uh, each piece is not capable of taking off very much material, so I have a a little stack of these things set up so I can keep working. So the nice thing about this method is that the guitar stays in tune and you can evaluate it without changing anything or, you know, applying any special tools. The strings do their usual job of tensioning uh, the neck. And boy, this is looking good now. Taking a few thousandths off these frets. And things are looking very nice here. So I know I'll get a lot of arguments, but <laughs> the way I do it is uh, I want the straight edge to touch the first fret. Uh, the twelfth fret and all the rest of the frets up here. Um, and then in the first octave there should be a little bit of relief. Of course less for light strings and low action and more for heavy strings and high action. Uh, and there should be a little more relief on the bass side of the neck then on the treble side of the neck. Um, anyway, that's what I'm going for here. So since, since the 
strings are straight, I can use the strings as a straight edge to check the relief. And you can hear that there is relief. Probably not enough relief on the bass side to make, okay. To, uh, probably not enough relief on the bass side. A little low on relief everywhere. Okay, so let's see what happens if we loosen the truss bar a little bit. Tiny little bit. Okay, got a little bit more relief. One of the questions for a guitar like this is how will it be set up for the new owner? And uh, of course, everybody wants their guitar to play well and, and easily. Um, but in order to get some dynamic range, we need some action. And if we need um, enough action to be able to dig into the guitar without it rattling too much. Um, and I think that probably I'm going to want a little bit more relief than, than this for its intended use. Now this guitar will be um, delivered with a set of 12s. And um, that's what it has on it now. Of course that's flat one on 12s. Okay, now we're more like it, so. Probably, I don't know, seven five or seven thousandths relief on the base side. Here's a piece of paper that's, um, whoops, <laughs> that's four thousandths thick. Can I do it? Yeah, it's about five thousandths. <laughs> Probably about right. Maybe a little, a little light. Okay, now the truss rod's loose. So I'm going to put the support the neck like this, and we're going to bend the neck just a little bit to see how much we can get the. In other words. Maybe the rod is sticking here. Now the nut, this nut is completely loose. And so this is as loose as we can get it. Okay, wow, that's tons of relief. All right, that's more than we want. All right, fine. So the truss rod is working perfectly. And it was just a little sticky before. So um, one thing that's a great idea is to remove this truss rod nut completely, make sure it's clean, and put a drop of oil in it. And I, um, I actually did that on this guitar when I first received it. And it's really good practice for any guitar to remove the truss rod nut, make sure everything's clean, and uh, put a drop of oil in there. Good practice. Okay, more relief than we need now. Well, this is looking very nice, and it's really, it's really great that 
A beautiful old guitar like this needs almost no adjustment, really. I mean, a little fret wear, a little bit of distortion up here. Now, <clears throat> these frets looked high they, to the straight edge. They, they looked like they were high. But I would suspect that probably these frets are right where they were when Jimmy built the guitar. And that, as usual, the neck has lifted up and rotated, distorted a tiny bit. Um, the, that kind of movement is called creep by engineers. And creep is a, a, a material movement or deformation um, in response to a long-term applied load. So that's what guitar strings are, are long-term applied load. And uh, over the years, the wood on the back of the neck stretches a little bit. And it's not something that can be adjusted with a truss rod. It's something that, um, that happens kind of locally in this area where the neck shape blooms into the heel shape. Um, this discontinuity of stiffness and strength from here to here uh, means that this part of the neck kind of acts as a hinge and the um, creep affects the material back here and isn't adjusted by the truss rod which basically adjusts just the first half of, um, of the first octave. Okay, so now we're going to have a look at this and make sure that we're satisfied with the condition of the, the fret tops. Of course, this we just sanded with 320, so that's fine. Um, down here we have file marks, but as I mentioned, they're, they're nice, they're pretty file marks. Um, all of our nicks are gone except for these two, which I have left um, for the final sanding. I judged that these were small enough that I could I could get them with sandpaper while I remove the file marks and therefore remove as little bit, uh, as little material from the frets as possible. In summation, we've got pretty much um, the lowest kind of, you know, fret height. No, that won't fit in. <laughs> we've got the lowest kind of fret height uh, that we can expect to be useful. So this guitar will, will play well um, for quite some time and um, uh, very happy with that. The next part of the job is to put a nice surface on all the fret tops and then to bring the fret tops back to a nice rounded shape. Okay, back at work here. <laughs> so here's the guitar without a tailpiece, and uh, no surprises whatsoever. Um, you can see this is, um, I think this is brass. It's got to be brass. Well, it's not magnetic. Um, and I guess this was a part that he bought from a commercial shop. And then he did these little mortises with a chisel. <clears throat> nice job. There's a scribed center line here. Um, and you can see belt sanding marks, and then these are going this way from sanding it flat. And then these marks are going this way where he, he used the end of the, the, end of the belt sander to um, relieve the middle of this and, and give it an attractive uh, look, nice curved look from the bottom. And <clears throat> regarding the, uh, the copper tape here as a string ground, um, I guess it could have been hooked up, but he didn't choose to do it. And uh, isn't that interesting? You can see a uh, little bit of folded tape here on top of the, whatever this is, plastic, I guess, that's designed to help uh, reinforce the ebony and keep it from splitting. Anyway, nice piece of wood, huh? <laughs>
So that's the tailpiece. No mysteries. And uh, let's have another look over here and just make sure we, we know what we're doing. So this is, it's not 33. 31, 32-ish, 30, I remember these were higher, but they came down a few, th four or five thousandths. And it's still a little high at the end in terms of fret height. That's the highest we have is, a, what is it, 34. Anyway, <clears throat> enough. Enough for the way these guitars are usually played. And now I'm going to take the 320 paper and just tease out the file marks. Again, I'm using this double diagonal method of sanding in this direction, following the curve, of course, and then following up with this. So actually, if you do it gently and you do it a good job, you can see that there's scratches going in both directions, which is um, a good indication that you did it right. dent here in the nice fret. Well, I could string it up again now. I've, I've left the strings attached to the guitar so that I can do that. I suspect that I'm okay without doing that because I've just done a tiny little bit of sanding with a fine grit, again, 320 grit. And I think we're going to go ahead and recrown the frets. That's the next part, next and final part of the fret work.